everyone, welcome today to Grandmaster's Choice. Um, I'm woman Grandmaster Talia Cervantes, and um, I'm guessing just by the title you're supposed to just choose something. And I really wanted to get talking about the, the Olympiad, right? The Olympiad going on in Chennai. And I feel like almost everybody I talk to within the chess community, I'm like, did you watch the games today? Did you see this result? Um, how do you feel about this team and that team? And did you see this player it's scoring so well? And yeah, so I just wanted to bring that here. And there are a lot of highlights. Um, there were a lot of highlights, especially in today's round. Uh, there are two teams who are still in the open section, two teams that are still with a perfect score. It's the Indian B team or the second team that they have since they're the host, they get to have multiple teams. And the other one is Armenia, actually. Um, so those two teams are certainly at the top and they're going to fight for first place tomorrow. And tied, there are a bunch of teams with, um, I guess you can call it four and a half out of five um, because they won all their matches and drew one. Um, we have the US, we have uh, Kazakhstan, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you have Iran. And I think India, India, the first Indian team, yeah. So, but another one, another team that I thought has been doing a really great job so far is the Cuban team, actually. And I wanted to talk about it. Um, I'm familiar with most of the players and they kind of range between 25-20 and 25-50 in rating. So their team average, I think it's at about 25-52. Uh, but they played against, uh, they played against, who was it? Um, against Hungary yesterday. And Hungary has a very strong team. They actually defeated Hungary. Um, they drew against Ukraine in the previous matchup. And I mean, Ukraine is one of the top, top countries. So that was amazing. And today they played against Azerbaijan who had a team rating of about 2680. They had Mamejarov in their lineup and the Cuban team actually won, which is amazing, right? It's like so, so surprising. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to go over some of the games and take a look at the, at how the Cuban players were, um, doing today. So the first game that I wanted to go over was from board two. Uh, it was, uh, Carlos Daniela Bornos. He is, I believe, number two in the country. He is um, an ex ex Cuban champion. Um, I don't think he won it this year, but maybe last year. And he's also very young. He's twenty years old, or maybe like twenty one years old. And obviously, it's kind of like the rising talent of the of the country. And I feel like this game against Mamedov kind of only. Uh, reinforces this idea. Um, so let's just go ahead and get started with the game. We have Albornoz with the white pieces. It's maybe a little too far from the screen, but you can kind of see the rating difference. Albornoz has 2566 and Mamedov has 2656. So it's those are um, 90 points, right, of rating difference. And it started off from a Sveshnikov. Um, this line obviously was popular before, but it got a lot of notoriety as well during the uh, World Chess Championship in 2018, which was uh, Fabiana Caruana against Magnus Carlsen. A lot of the games had the debate in this in this line. And after knight two f6, knight c3, e5, knight two b5, pawn to d6. The idea, essentially, as we're going to see it, is that white gets a really solid control of the square on d5, but black is going to try and find counterplay, especially on the king side, right? With future ideas of um, f5, f4, pushing forward the, the king side. So knight to d5 was played, takes, takes, knight to b8, the knight is going to regroup to d7, continue with f5, probably put the knight on f6. Um, Pawn to, pawn to a4, 
usually um, here is kind of a crucial moment for white. You kind of have to be very careful on what you do. And A4 and C4 are both the uh, main lines. C4 is actually a little bit more uh, popular. But kind of the point is that you don't just allow A6, B5 from, from black and let them have space on this side of the board as well. But pawn to A4 was played, bishop to E7, bishop to E2, castle, bishop to D2. And right off the bat, you know, you can kind of see that, that um, white hasn't castled just, just yet. They're kind of keeping that possibility flexible just to see what happens. And after pawn to a6, knight to a3, black did kind of a rare move for a Sicilian. He went pawn to a5. Um, the idea of pawn to a5 is quite simple. If, for example, something like f5 had been played instead, then white is the one that gets to play pawn to a5 with the help of this bishop on d2. It almost looked like the bishop wasn't doing so much, but now you can see the point. It uh, supports the pawn here on a5. And the future idea is knight to c4 with some ideas of the knight getting in. Uh, a possible variation, for example, is knight to d7. And after knight to c4, pawn to f4, bishop to b4, putting pressure on this pawn right here. Um, even uh, the rook can swing up, right? It's a very, very nice idea. The rook can even come to c3, put some pressure onto this queen. You see that black has very little space on the queen side. The pawn can come to f3 to stop any any um, expansions on the center and king side and from then on white is most likely going to have a pleasant um, pleasant position so that was the point with a5 from mamedov and the only inconvenience that it has is that it kind of gives the the square on b5 back to back to white right so uh Albert knows decides to play bishop to b5 and after pawn to f5, queen to e2, knight to d7, and knight to c4. And you can see how the white pieces are kind of shifting, but in a way that it doesn't look like they are, it doesn't look like they are just maneuvering around senseless. The bishop on b5 uh, kind of has some controls in this diagonal. It's in general just a lot better than if it wasn't b3 or c4, right? Just because of the e4 push. And uh, the knight coming to c4 puts pressure onto this pawn here on d6. And we're gonna see some other future ideas, but essentially white has no weaknesses in this position that black can attack, right? It's just kind of improving the pieces step by step. Knight to c5. And now the one piece that is no longer uh, doing something jumps to a better square, bishop to e3, right? And after, let's say, do you think that pawn to f4 would be a, a good idea for black? Or does white have a, have a good continuation now? Um, actually, yeah, that works completely fine. I was thinking more of like d6. Uh, because... After bishop takes, there is rook d1, or a long castle, and the bishop is under some trouble. But yeah, essentially the, the pawn structure from black is getting completely disrupted, even if white is giving up the, the bishop, right? Um, so, queen to c7 was played. And now that, the, now that the queen is defending the knight, and the idea of f4 is a lot more real, because this becomes a a huge problem, white is going to have issues on the light squares from now on, the dark squares from now on. Uh, now that f4 is actually a threat, white decides to do it themselves. They decide to play pawn to f4, um, just kind of blocking off the, the ideas. And after pawn to e4, the question is how to proceed here, how to proceed here as as white. What is going to be your plan for the game? The idea that white did in this game is very innovative. It's not the most popular continuation, um, but 
it does make a lot of sense and the play is very practical once you start thinking about it. Some people in the chat are saying rook a3 with like another lift. Some people are saying g4, short castle. There are lots of ideas, but the question is which one did the grandmaster go for? Some people are playing h4 as well. This one I understand a little less. Uh, I guess the idea is h5, h6, but I guess the pawn can go to g6 after that. Do you guys have any ideas? Right. Especially now that we played a four and e four was played, taking the, the knight would lead to a lot of weaknesses. We kind of have two options, right? Where we can keep the position a bit more, you know, um, normal, I guess, with short castle. But there's also the possibility of long castle, right? And the question is which one, which one seems more, I guess, more desirable, right? Because they have different ideas and usually in this position, uh, White Castle Short. There are some interesting games, actually. One of them being... Um, what's their name? One of them being... Uh, Nullerbeck against uh, Gukesh, who are, funny enough, the two guys in this Olympiad who have a perfect score so far. Um, and the... The move that Arbornell decided to go with in this position was Castle Long. And the idea is that, okay, I know usually when I castle this side, black plays for an attack and they can open up the position very easily. But you're not going to get to do that this game. And I'm going to start playing with h3, g4, opening up that side of the board. And I'm going to go for an attack. So that's essentially what he's saying, right? It kind of makes the position a little bit more practical and, and it does make sense because the Sveshnikov is one of those lines that are very rare in the sense that black actually plays more on the king side and we can see that here, right, where the most advanced pawns are. Um, so it makes sense to put the king to safety, right, to try and bring it to, to this side of the board and then play for an attack towards this king, right? White has most of the control of the light squares the pawn on the pawn break on b5 is not as strong when the pawn is not on a6 right so essentially black is saying uh, white is saying come at me and try to do something while i open up the position on the king side so it was just a very innovative very interesting idea from white and black decided to play with bishop to d7 try to trade off those bishops um, another possibility was bishop f6 for example i feel like this move looks natural um, but after something like king to b1, um, it's just a position. White is a little bit more comfortable. 
uh, just because of the space advantage. But the position is still playable. And once again, the idea is h3 and g4. But the move bishop to d7 allows white to have a really interesting, really interesting um, tactical resource. It didn't actually happen in the game, but there is a tactical idea here for, uh, for white that puts them with a very big strategical advantage. Bishop takes knight. Um, I mean, of course, the queen cannot take it, and if pawn takes, there is d6. So the main question is what happens if bishop takes. Bishop takes pawn, and I guess. Well, I guess I could go for this, right? Um, and after it takes, takes, and black ends up a piece up. So that might be a problem. I mean, you probably have to go for this. Bishop takes, takes, and then take this one. And then either queen takes or pawn takes. Pawn takes leads to d6, so maybe not that. But... Um, Queen takes, and I feel like the fact that the A file is now more open and the pawn can push can be um, a little bit scary for white. But there are some ideas of like uh, forcing some exchange to happen and white ends up ahead strategically. Knight to e5, knight to e5, I think, I think we're going to straight up take, because if you play d6, I'm going to take with the bishop. Oh, unless you want to do like bishop takes c5 now, and if bishop takes something like rook d7, and if Queen takes bishop d7. Uh, but then I guess bishop takes happens. And after bishop takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, bishop takes. It's a little complex, right? Like, it's a lot of moves to look ahead. Uh, but maybe not through e5, but a different square. It takes d6. I don't think this works because of bishop takes. And everything is going to be protected just enough. But we can try to set up some pins here. Knight b6. Yeah, knight b6 actually. 
And the point is that after queen takes, we get bishop takes d7, and the knight cannot take back because of um, the queen hanging, right? And if white gets the pair of bishops in this position, right, and the power to even go to e6, if, if um, we want to, is very, very strong. So uh, this bishop can come to d5, pawn can come to g4 once again, and the position is just a lot more dominant for for white. Obviously, we didn't get any material from this tactic, but it just leads to a much better strategical position. And I kind of really like those tactics uh, because it ends up being um, it ends up being like, kind of unexpected sometimes. But yeah, knight to v6 would have been a really nice move. Um, however, the idea that white went for here is also completely fine, which is bishop takes d7, Knight takes d7, and now he's thinking, okay, my knight on c4 is really nice, but it doesn't actually have a, it doesn't actually have any target right now, any anything that it can attack, and I want to make sure I don't allow any pawn breaks on this side of the board, otherwise I will give my opponent counterplay. So he decides to play knight to a3, and the idea is very simple. The knight is just going to b5. If it ever wants to, from b5, it can go into d4 and e6. Um, just a future future idea and um, yeah once the knight gets to b5 king goes to b1 there's not much that black has to attack right like it's very difficult to break through in the in in the queen side so this was played and rook a c8 king to b1 knight to c5 knight to b5 uh, both players are making pretty normal moves the pawn, on, uh, the pawn on a4 is hanging, so b3 was played. And the whole, the whole, point, the whole thing is that, okay, um, how, how is black going to make use of the fact of me moving my, my pawns in front of the king, right? Because the bishop can come to f6 if it wants to, That's what's, that was the next move actually. But it doesn't have any target into this diagonal either, right? Um, so white is just going to start the idea on the king side now that everything is consolidated on the other side of the board so pawn to h3 knight to a6 pawn to g4 and black kind of i, I feel like black mamadov started um kind of worrying a little bit once uh, they got to this stage of the game because he, uh, his moves begin to be a little bit rushed so for example after Knight to c7, takes, takes, pawn to c4 was played. And the whole idea is that there are not going to be any pawn breaks, right? Um, but Mamadov, you know, being an aggressive player, he went for b5 anyways. Um, I mean, this is kind of a practical move. You're also playing it against a grandmaster, so a grandmaster who probably calculated b5. So you must assume that in most of the variations, white is going to be just fine. Another move would have been bishop to c3. And it kind of does make sense. But after it takes, takes, and queen to c2, we have a double attack, right? So there are just a lot of issues with the black position. But after pawn to b5, a takes b5, pawn to a4. And the main question is, can we take this right here? Would that be a good idea? Uh, the queen can take on c4, but if the queen takes on c4, I mean, you're kind of also trading off queens. And I feel like this is going to be okay for, for white, now that the king is no longer in any danger. Um, maybe I can play something like, mm, something like rook a2, I would say, if I'm not getting checkmated. Maybe I am. But I'm guessing maybe they can try to cover. Something like this. And I mean, there are still two pawns that you need to take care of. To be fair, you can take off one of them, but the pawn 
once this pawn reaches b6, the position is, you know, going to still be in favor of white just because of that pass pawn. Um, there is a way that you can continue with the attack with the queens on the board. And b takes a4, like, completely takes away all of white's advantage and gives it to black. Okay, eight is possible, but there is a better piece that we can bring forward, right? Yeah, queen to a5, right? And uh, next move, well, of course, the pawn is hanging, but next move is also queen to b4, right? And after queen to b4, rook takes c4 is coming, and the position is completely collapsing. So, for example, if queen c2, queen b4, and rook takes c4, and white is completely lost. So it's very important not to give in to, um, you know, just the material that is being offered to, to you at the moment. And a uh, white player knew this, and he played pawn to b6, kind of an intermediate move to prevent um, any queen a5 ideas. And after queen to b7, b4, right? Keeping the position mostly closed around his king. And after queen a6, rook c1, all that white needs to do here is consolidate. Make sure that black's attack is completely neutralized. And if they manage to do that, they're kind of just winning the game because of the, the amount of pawns that they have, right? And how they are past pawns. So after pawn to a3, king to a2, not allowing anything. Rook to b8, rook to c2. And now it's just the time to start offering trades, right? And for whatever exchange of queens that uh, black decides to go for, white is going to be completely winning because of the past pawns. So queen a4 was played, and then c6, queen takes b4, rook to b1, and just a couple of moves after um, Mavedov decided to resign. Move 38. And it's literally impossible to stop c7, and the position is just completely crashing for white. It's a little crazy, it's almost like black was just so close, but they never... Uh, could make the pieces work into a, a real attack for for white. So this was actually a very quick victory for um, Carlos Daniela Bornos and uh, I think by the time I woke up this game was over and I mean the game started at, I don't know what time exactly maybe like 6 a.m. and I woke up at around 8 a.m. and uh, this game was over by then usually got Masters games you know they take a bit longer, like three hours, four hours. I mean, like longer than, let's say, master level games. Uh, but yeah, this was relatively a, a quick game. And the exciting part is that not only was this a win, but board three and board four were winning for Cuba as well, right? Uh, board four. It had Omar Almeida, and he is like 25, 20 something right now, but he's kind of like a legendary Cuban grandmaster. And he actually had a winning queen endgame. Um, I think it was uh, two versus two on one side of the board, and then on the other side, he had a pass pawn. And he was going with his king, his queen was protecting, and he had that pass pawn that. Would have been really nice if he, you know, managed to, to win the endgame. I'm pretty sure he could have traded queens at one point and get into a winning pawn endgame. 
Um, but he ended up making a draw, and that was okay because um, next game uh, was Basif Durarveli from uh, Azerbaijan. He actually he actually uh, lived here uh, a couple of years ago. He went to Webster University, and with the black pieces is uh, Luis Ernesto Quesada Perez. Uh, something really funny. Uh, in the Cuban team, there are two players with the last name Quesa Perez, and a lot of people may think they're siblings. Uh, they are not. I think they're from the same town, but they're not siblings. But board one, Yasser Quesa, he's, uh, his brother um, is another grandmaster, like 2600 level grandmaster, and he lives here in St. Louis. So it's kind of like a funny, <laughs> kind of like a funny. Um, like a coincidence, I guess. But yes, yeah, so going over the the um, board three game, I kind of want to focus more on the end game. But uh, I will show the game from the start. It was a neither, and don't we all just love neither? Bishop to e three, uh, e five was played. Another variation. It can be a little tricky sometimes. It's knight to g four. If anyone is interested. But after pawn to e5, the knight has two options, right? Most of the times the knight goes to b3, but in this game the knight went to f3. And essentially the idea is that it leaves the square on b3 for this bishop, and it has the idea to come to c4, get onto the knight's diagonal since black decided to play pawn to e5. And whenever the bishop goes to e6, the knight can jump to g5. That's kind of the point. So bishop to e7 was played in the game, bishop to c4, castle, castle, everything looks quite natural. And knight to a5, trying to get rid of that bishop, and bishop to d5 was played. This is a very interesting move, you usually don't see something like this, but the point is that if knight takes d5, the knight is going to recapture on d5. There is a very strong um, outpost, the pawn can go to c4 in the future. And... There are immediate ideas with bishop to b6, making a skewer, I guess. And the knight can also get rid of this bishop on e7 whenever it wants. So, since knight takes d5 is not possible, bishop to e6 was played. Rook d1, queen c7, rook a c1. Uh, personally, I think this move, rook a c1, is a little strange. Obviously, it looks to defend the pawn on c2 in some future, especially because the the, it makes sense to put the, the black rook here on the C file. Um, I think it might it might be due to the fact that white didn't feel super comfortable in the position. Usually the square on D5 is for the knight, right? So usually in this lines, um, let's say the bishop is on... Sometimes it's on E2, sometimes I guess it can be on B3. But usually it's the knight going to D5, right? And once the knight goes to D5... Uh, the pawn goes to either c3 or c4 in most of the variations because black does something like queen c7, rook c8, puts pressure on the pawn, so white plays c3. That's usually how these positions go, right? So I think due to the fact that the knight is kind of stuck here on, F3, on c3 and it doesn't have any way to improve, um, white just decided to play rook a c1, maybe, you know, expecting in some future that if black takes, the knight takes, and the pawn is already covered. Um, but it ends up kind of not doing too much in this square for most of the most of the game. It just looks kind of like an awkward move. H6 was played. Overall, this move makes a lot of sense. It prevents both ideas of knight g5 and bishop g5, getting rid of the main controller of the d5 square. Just kind of a prophylactic move. Knight to d2 was played. Rook to c8, pawn to a4. Queen d7, bishop to b6. And bishop to d8. And it is kind of in this position where you wish the rook was on a1. So it could be reinforcing this pawn here on a4. Um, but it isn't. And the bishop going to d8 is a very typical maneuver in the Sicilian as well. Um, especially, you know, if there is no dark square bishop from white in this diagonal, it can go to b6 and get into a much better than diagonal than here on e7, right? And the point is that if the bishops actually trade, 
after something like bishop d8, rook d8, uh, the knight is going to come back onto c6 and d4. So that makes sense. And overall, the black pieces just look a lot more centralized and comfortable than the white pieces, right? Because again, the bishop on d5 is a little strange. Uh, the rook on c1 doesn't do too much. And the knight on d2 probably has to move once again. Can go to c4 because you have too many pieces attacking it, right? So that's going to be a piece lost. Um, but it's also not clear when the knight is going to where the knight is going to next. It might just have to come back to f3. Uh, but then something like knight to knight to c6 and position is completely fine for for black. So okay, in this position, bishop takes e6 was played first. Pawn takes and bishop takes takes rook to b1. Uh, rook to b1 is another another move that is kind of awkward. I think the idea may have been something like pawn to b4 and then pawn to b5, breaking through on this side. Um, but kind of the point is that the black knight is not looking to retreat itself to c6, but it also has some ideas of going to c4, right? Especially now that you move the rook away and there's less pressure over uh, le less protection over this file. Queen to c6 was played on to h3 um, and rook to d7 just kind of keeping the position all together everything is safe knight to f3 queen to b6 and after a couple of moves like rook to d3 rook to c7 there are all of a sudden ideas of rook takes d3 right takes takes and the position would be winning for for black and the knight is also coming on to to c4 so knight to d2 knight c4 takes takes queen e3 and then we get into this end game uh how would you guys evaluate this end game especially i guess you know since you're looking at it from the black perspective how would this end game be because a lot of times people are like oh you know we got to an end game the all of the problems are gone i can probably draw this but You'd still need to play with a lot of activity in endgames. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, especially in the center pawns, right? They control a lot of jumps uh, that white may have. And another reason why black is better is, again, just because of this pressure here on the C file. It's almost as if this knight won't ever be able to move uh, because it protects this pawn and this pawn and this pawn, right? It, it's, um, it's, the knight is going to be stuck there. There is no way to make progress. And the rooks won't have any great square either. I mean, technically, you can start putting them on the D file. It does make a lot of sense, but the pawn will always be protected, especially when the king starts coming up. And this rook also has to stay protecting this pawn here on E4. So overall, the, white, the black position is a ju just a lot more comfortable to play. King to F7 was played. Um, yeah, so another idea in the future could be playing b5, takes takes, and pushing the pawn to b4. We gotta see how that works, though. So, king to f1, king to e7, rook to d1, rook to b4, trying to provoke some weaknesses, pawn to b3 was played, and rook to b6, and essentially the rook just threatens to come back and keep on putting pressure on the c2 pawn. Rook d3, rook to c6, king to e1. And now, okay, of course, we have one thread, right? We have one weakness that we can put pressure on uh, from black to white. But uh, the point is that we're going to create more, right? We need to create some other weakness in the position so that we can alternate between these two problems that the opponent has. And, you know, until it reaches a point where it's the, almost impossible to to keep everything under control. So from that, 
uh, black decided to play pawn to g5. And the idea is quite simple. They're going to start pushing pawns on the other side of the board, create some weaknesses in the in the king side, and then start building up. So king to d2, pawn to h5, pawn to g3, and pawn to h4. And the thing now is that if white decides to keep the position more close with something like pawn to g4, uh, white, uh, black still has the idea of playing rook to c5 and b5. That is still completely playable. However, they also now have the possibility of playing knight d7, knight f8, knight g6, and knight to f4. And if, if, if the black knight gets to f4, the pawn on h3 will always be a problem. The rook on d3 is a little bit stuck. Um, so it's just going to be a lot harder for, for white to play. Maybe we can even play something like king to f6 and prepare this pawn to d5 break. So g4 wasn't played, but king to e1, just trying to keep the position more flexible. Rook to c5, king to f1, and after it takes, takes uh, pawn to g4. And the funny thing is that if pawn to h4, knight to h5 once again, the knight is the best blockader, um, it puts pressure on the pawn on g3, and the pawn will never be able to, to become a queen. So king to g2, pawn to b5, and you know now that the now that we managed to get the the white king farther away, right? Remember that it had uh, come closer and maybe it intended to protect the pawn on c2. Now that we made it go back towards the king side, the pawn on c2 is still weak. The two rooks are more stuck than ever because of the pawn here. Uh, we start uh, going after you know going for an invasion with pawn to b5 and threatening some trades and pawn to b4. And the white position just collapses. So after takes takes, pawn to b4, rook to c4. Now the pawn on b4 is a massive weakness. And after takes takes, picked up that pawn. The other ones are coming. And as long as nothing hangs and we don't allow any, the opponent to get any counterplay, the position is completely winning for for black. And after a couple more moves just of maneuvering around and, you know, the players were probably in time trouble. Uh, the position just became totally, totally lost for white. We see that they play, he played actually rook c7, not even allowing any checks. But after rook to f4, rook takes, rook takes c2, it is impossible to escape safely the idea of rook to f3 checkmate. So this was an amazing... Um, an amazing result, not only for, for, you know, the individual players, both of them be 2,600 grandmasters. That's difficult to do at any level, even if you're at 2,700. Um, it's very difficult to defeat 2,600s. And I mean, actually, if you look at the Olympiad, a lot of players who are 2,700, they're drawing a lot of games. Um, I feel like that's just part of the strategy, right? Like as long as you don't lose, um, you did a good job with your game, but you know, like if you want to win, you gotta <laughs> go uh, go for some initiative. And you can see that even with the black pieces here, um, the low rider player managed to completely outplay white. And um, like I said, not only is it an amazing individual result for those players, but also. Um, for the team and the Cuban team ended up winning two and a half two one and a half against Azerbaijan this uh, pushes Azerbaijan further down in the list I think they're on like the spot 27th or something and the Cuban team is set to face Spain tomorrow who lost today against um, the Indian team there was a very interesting game uh, in similar style to the first game we saw today there was a, this game between uh, Shirov and Gukesh and essentially it was just Gukesh with the black pieces saying you're not checkmating me in this position even if my, even if my king is castle long um, and that's what happened and he ended up with uh, with a win against Shirov which is massive right taking into consideration that the other day um, on Sunday for a double x time I showed two Shirov games right so we know how strong of a player he is um, but yeah so that's kind of all for today um i would recommend 
just everybody just keep on watching the olympia i feel like it's super exciting uh the women's team um i think the women's team for both cuba and the u.s lost unfortunately but it's amazing the peruvian team defeated the u.s and i mean I, I, i've known a lot of peruvian players they they are very strong the female team is really strong they have daisy Cori as well who's kind of like legendary uh, Peruvian player and for Latin America and girls and all of that so yeah there are just a lot of upsets going on there are a lot of interesting games you can probably get a lot of opening um, novelties just by watching the games from the event and yeah overall it's just like a very unifying very exciting and yeah it's just one of those tournaments that everybody around the world watches and it always kind of leaves a big impact so yeah that's all for today that's kind of why i wanted to talk about it because the olympias is just so exciting um but yeah thank you so much to everybody who was online watching i guess i'll see you all tomorrow with some play the people or some other arena and yeah have a good one thank you